Welcome to Beyond the Scenes, the podcast that goes a little deeper into topics and segments that originally aired on The Daily Show. This is what you got to think of this podcast as, right? Okay, like, you know you got prom, right? You go to your senior prom, you have a good time at the dance. This podcast is everything that happens after the prom. We're the party bus. We're the tickets to the club. We're the fight at Waffle House. Don't worry, we're still going to get you home by midnight and your daddy ain't going to know that you tore up the tuxedo and you ruined his deposit. This week, we're delving a little deeper into a topic that we just recently dis- uh, discussed on the show. I went down to Atlanta to learn about a place called Cop City. Cop City is a training facility that's being presented as the new way to train Atlanta's police and fire departments. But Cop City's brought a lot of controversy. Give it a clip. Atlanta's busy downtown descended into chaos over the weekend. Hundreds of protesters marched in the streets in the wake of the death of a 26-year-old environmental activist. The activist was killed on Wednesday as officers cleared protesters from the site of a planned police training center. Police training center? But these guys are trained, right? This isn't an armed militia of interns. Back before things got this bad, I went to Atlanta and met with local activist Jasmine Burnett. The Atlanta Police Foundation is building a massive urban warfare training facility with bomb testings, tear gas explosions, a shooting range. Didn't people march to defund the police? It looked like they refunded the police. They did. Activists have dubbed this development Cop City, an 85-acre, $90 million complex including a shooting range, burn buildings, and a mock city that includes apartments, a school, even a bar. So this is basically like Six Flags for the police. Yes, it's a playground. You can't call it a playground. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, you're right, this is literally a playground. But I had a dream about how they could make this project more appealing to activists. We name it after Martin Luther King. Doesn't matter. Tyler Perry presents the training facility. The name doesn't change the impact. To help us get deeper into the weeds of this conversation, I'm joined by two wonderful Atlanta-based journalists, George Cheedy and King Williams. George King, how you doing today? We're awesome. I'm awesome. You're awesome. George, thank you for that. Now, King, you got to top that. Make me feel more than awesome, please. Uh, you're the greatest of all time. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I'll take that. That was better than yours, George. George, you got to work on your greetings to me. <laughs> I will suck less later. <laughs> Before we get into the back and forth controversy that is Cop City, let's just define what Cop City is. George, I'll start with you. Break down what it is exactly. So Cop City, and by the way, there are people who hate calling it Cop City because it's they think it's pejorative, and I think it's short. Uh, the Atlanta Police Training Center is a replacement for the Atlanta Police Department's uh, police training facilities, which are garbage. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest. Like, that's, that's just the truth of it. Problem is, it's a $90 million, like, park, uh, like a fun amusement park for cop training. So like a real world, like like in the military where they recreate urban warfare in the Middle East and, and yeah. doors and rooms and all of that. Was the fire department training aspect of Cop City always part yes. of it? Or was that rolled into it as part of a PR? Oh, no, it's not all about the police. No, it definitely was always part of it. Like, okay. and, I, and again, like the, the, the current facilities are, are inadequate. Like, that's the truth. Like, they're falling apart. There's mold all over everything. It's awful. Um, However, what they're trying to build is expensive, and people are not happy about it. Okay, so then, King, give me some examples of some of the stuff that's in Cop City. I imagine for a fire department, you need a building that can catch on fire so you can work on putting out fires. But for the police aspects of it, at a time where we're talking about defunding the police and taking less resources, taking some resources away from police departments and reallocating them to education and infrastructure and other things that could also help reduce crime, what are some of the things within Cop City that has people so riled up, King? Yeah, so in addition to the price, it's really about the terms of the deal. So the, the site that Georgia is talking about is 350 acres. For perspective, all of Six Flags over Georgia, including the parking lots, is 290 acres. So this lets you know initially what that was. And the thing that was more egregious was that three, that 350 acres was going to be given to the Atlanta police at a rate of $10 a year. And so, you know, that's a part of Atlanta and South, uh, Southwest DeKalb County, East 10 Atlanta. 10 per acre per year or no, just $10, $10 the whole lot? $10. A number three at, at McDonald's. That's how much it was going to be per year. And so when for we talk one and about- one and a half, six flags. For one and a half. Hands- yes. And so then people got upset. And so then they reduced the acreage down to still, t- uh, to still $10 a year, but now at 85 acres. 
And so 85 acres is still a pretty large amount of space for this particular facility. It's a shopping mall. It is. It is a very oh. large suburban shopping mall. And so then the other part of the, the, the cost that you asked was there's a couple things that they're doing that in many ways, this is their they're their owed to the Atlanta police. And so you have everything from a horse training facility, which they're already currently trained nearby at Grant Park, which costs them effectively nothing because they're given a, a lease through the zoo to also have their training f- facility for their horses there. They bring in the burn building in, which is going to be at a cost, which they used to do off of Metropolitan Avenue, University Avenue, which coincidentally enough was not too far from the, the place where Rayshard Brooks was murdered at. Um, they're also bringing in every particular uh, unit that they've had before in one unified facility. And that facility right now, they're estimating that construction costs will be about $90 million. There's a high probability due to the insurance that's going to be on it as it, what happened yesterday when some processors set fire to some equipment that that insurance is probably going to bump this whole project up to well over $100 million when it's all said and done. How long have the two of you been both covering this development? And, you know, like, when did this become a, huh, that's peculiar? Because it would seem off the top, George, if you say that the training facilities are inadequate, and I would imagine after the Rayshard Brooks fiasco and everything that happened with George Floyd in 2020, and then you all had the blue flu thing with the Atlanta PD where droves of officers were calling in sick as a form of silent protest to the officers being charged and everything that happened there. So I would imagine something like Cop City, if the police department has inadequate training, and then there is a new facility that's going to be multi-million in bells and whistles. That would help morale in theory. So when did this become a thing of, huh, why is this bad beyond the fact that why y'all spending all that money on that and not stuff over here? So one, you're really well informed. I'm impressed. Uh, and that's the staff. That ain't me. I'm going to tell you right now, we got a great team behind the scenes that make me sound intelligent. Keep going, though, but thank you. The uh, Both of us have been watching this since the beginning. And part of it is that people were in the street in 2020 saying we want better cops, we want fewer cops, we want more social workers and fewer people in jail. And then the city turned around and said, we're going to spend 30 million in public money and 60 million in private money to build this sort of playground for cops. And that's not the thing. If, If that was just it, people would be irritated. They're... It's not the city who's going to own this thing. It's this Atlanta Police Foundation. The second largest police foundation in the United States is at the Atlanta Police Foundation. It's not the Chicago Cops Foundation. It's not L.A. It's not Baltimore. It's not D.C. It's Atlanta, like, which is crazy to begin with. And it looks like this thing where they're going to be. It's not just the Atlanta police who are going to train there. Anybody who's got a police force in the whole South southern United States is going to be able to go there, too. And so even if the Atlanta cops are training like we want them to train, some podunk yokel town from North Tennessee who wants to learn how to kick the crap out of people more effectively can come down there and train any way they like. And there's nothing that the city can do to change that because they don't run the facility. And so this thing can, instead of propagating the best possible police training you could get, you end up with this thing that could propagate the very worst kind of police training that you could get. All over the Southeast. All over the Southeast. People are comparing this to the School of Americas, where out in uh, at Fort Benning in Columbus for years, uh, South American dictators would send their troops to learn how to put down riots. You know, you know there that's the comparison that's being made. Gentlemen, talk to me a little bit about how the construction of this facility is going to affect the surrounding counties and areas. Like that part of it was something within our daily show piece that we did. We weren't able to get into that at the depth that I wanted to in the actual segment, even though I was outside with Jackie Eccles on that damn river for about four hours and a kayak. And I don't know if y'all ever been in a river and a kayak and you ain't had breakfast and the water <laughs> the water is low, so you keep hitting sandbars, so you gotta scoot your booty across the skin. I ruined a good pair of Jordans. Talk to us about why I was on a damn river miles away from the actual construction site of Cop City and why that part of the story 
it's as equally important as it is about the over policing aspects of it. All right. So for people at home who don't know what this is, Atlanta is very unique in the sense that it sits in between two counties, Fulton County and DeKalb County. And the TLDR version of this is that the site that Cop City is in is in a part known as colloquially as Atlanta DeKalb. So it's the city of Atlanta property, but within DeKalb County. And how this plays out is all of the wastewater that comes through both the city of Atlanta and DeKalb County go along the South River, which is what Roy was uh, paddling on. That mm-hmm. river in particular, though, has a lot of people who dump things illegally and a lot of uh, dumps who legally dump into that space. Cop City is now going to be contributing to the South River's pollution as well. And because of the terms of the deal, there is no oversight for what happens on the site, especially the burn building. And also with everything that's in the sediment that's already on the site. So that sediment is going to just be impacted more with the construction and then with the activities on there. And that's going to also be getting back into the river. And that river in particular, is a, it's a piece that I'm working on for something else, is that we think that that may actually be a cancer alley. And what that means is for a lot of the black people who live in southwest DeKalb County and people who live on that side of the city of Atlanta, they're getting inundated with a lot of uh, air pollution, a lot of water pollution, and a lot of ground um, pollution as well from all the people who are dumping into that. And the police in Cop City are also going to be contributing to that as well. And as a result of that, we have this issue where the place that you're paddling eventually goes back into the South River fully. And that thing goes all the way through DeKalb County, which has seen an influx of teachers in particular who are teaching along this, this river path get cancer, die of cancer, and get other related diseases now because of all of the environmental things that are happening just from that river in particular. Then also, George, what Jackie was trying to explain to me, and this was a part of the piece that we ended up cutting out because environmental issues and then environmental racism, it is very hard to make quick and concise to fit into a 30-minute television show and also make it funny. But she was trying to explain to me basically The build site for Cop City is a lot of dirt. Dirt absorbs water. You put concrete over dirt, the water got to go somewhere when it rained. The water would now go downstream and tear up more shit. Explain to me. She didn't say it like that. Jackie Eccles is a... No, she's a... She is filled with unimpeachable truth. Like... (laughs) But the flooding, the flooding aspects of it as well, yeah. are there any ways to measure that or has that been taken into account? So, yeah, let me talk about that a little bit. Like Atlanta, everybody wants to move to Atlanta. Everybody wants to move to Atlanta. 75,000 people end up in Metro Atlanta every year and we're not building anything for them, except that we are. Like the you, you look around Atlanta, there are construction cranes everywhere. And they're paving everything. And whenever you pave enough stuff, the water that would normally go one way goes another. And so, like, you get a really good rain in Atlanta and the highway will flood. Like, that's how bad it is. Like, Mm. a really solid couple of days of rain and you can't drive on I-285 without going through 10 inches of water. The worst flooding is happening in DeKalb because we're, our sewer systems are garbage because we didn't overbuild for all the people that have been coming here and all this runoff is being created. And it's going into black neighborhoods. It's going to neighborhoods like mine. I live on a, a creek and we had to do a million dollars worth of remediation on that creek because, you know, when we had a good, a good rain, it would flood houses. So let's drop a mall in the middle of this Mm. river, essentially, and see how many houses of black people we're going to flood downstream. And the worst part of this is that area is gentrifying, but it's also filled with black homeowners. Black homeowners are rare. Like, we don't have enough black homeowners. <laughs> and so you're going to tell me that people who are actually starting to get equity in their houses, are those are the folks you're going to flood out by building this? Yeah, people are kind of pissed off about that. But they're only kind of pissed off. They're not super pissed off because it hasn't happened yet. Okay, so we've covered what Cop City is. We've covered all of the different ways that it could be bad for the community, be it fiscally, be it environmentally. Now we need to talk about the people and what they're doing to try and stop it. After the break, I want to talk about this group of people I met called the Forest Defenders who are actually living on the Cop City construction site. And who the hell is for Cop City? 
if everything that y'all have just laid out is talking about it's bad for this, it's bad for that, it's bad for that, who was the person that wrote a check and was like, here's 40 million, good luck and go build it? It's Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. Beyond the Scenes, we are back. We are discussing Cop City, oh, oh excuse me, George, the Atlanta City Police Training and Fire Medical Facility Red- Readiness Activity Zone. That's the nah, call it Cop City. Call it <laughs> Cop City. Like, don't ever make me put that in a headline. Nobody will read the story. <laughs> we, we've covered so far the, the cons of Cop City and the fact that it could become a place to mistrain a lot of officers in a lot of different places. There are environmental um, issues that will come from Cop City. It is a fiscal boondoggle as well. Part of the reason Cop City is starting to cost a lot of money is because there are a group of people that have encamped themselves in the con- in the construction area, like literally living in this area. They call themselves the Forest Defenders. And I was able to meet some of these people for my story, and they were extremely secretive because, you know, it's, it's, we're getting into like real secret enemy of the state type stuff where they, they believe their cell phones are being tapped, they're being monitored by drones, they believe the police are trying to come in undercover and embed themselves with them. Like it is a lot of different things that are being accused from the forest defenders towards the city of Atlanta. And you all's coverage of this from the inception of Cop City, when did you start seeing the forest defenders start to become a thing? And how did that whole movement emerge? And when did it start becoming deadly? So to that point, um, Atlanta's like overall activist ecosystem for the last couple of years have been relatively decimated. And so the few activists who really knew about it almost from the beginning had already started staging protests, either just online or uh, throughout the city and especially around that place. So people were already there almost from day one about the site. Decimated um, in what sense, like arrest and just kind of torn apart during George Floyd movement or? Well, even before George Floyd. So that's a good point. So a lot of our activists, there's no infrastructure. So activists can't necessarily go into a heritage foundation. They don't get into law. They don't get into the universities even. So after a series of uh, crackdowns on various protests, with the last being this thing called Tent City over at the old Turner Field, which is now Georgia State Stadium, a lot of them, after getting arrested, a lot of them, after being you know fired from their jobs, they just left. They either left the city or they left the, the movements altogether, and then there was no other people to kind of come in and and take over like that next wave of, of leadership, which is something you see in most pro- political movements. And so the people who started coming around and started encamping themselves, a lot of them weren't necessarily from Atlanta, but a lot of them were getting news about Atlanta from people on the ground or former activists of people sharing things in their social feeds. So they felt emboldened to come here because there was nobody to literally defend the force that was there because the activists who normally would have been here in most cities just aren't here anymore. We just don't have that ecosystem, not because they are are weak or anything like that, just because there's nothing to support them. There was no way to level up. So that's kind of how we get to that point of the forest defenders. And also the forest defenders, I, I want to add into that is that a lot of them also interact with other groups like general historic preservationists, arborists, um, local decab residents who didn't like the project. So it was a lot easier for them to start getting familiar with the city, get familiar with the players really fast because there was a lot of people who just didn't like this project for various reasons. What was interesting when I was out there, uh, King, was that locals were like bringing them food and little Debbie's like legit care packages you know george if we want to get into the military you know they was dropping off the mre kits hoorah they was dropping off the supply but like they were like straight up supply drops like from just strangers being sent money a number of different ways i won't say how but they had infrastructure set up where they could get that level of support from outsiders so they get in they start in camping and they start doing things to kind of be you know, a pain to the construction companies, you know, like they may tear up some of the equipment or they'll set up a blockade so you can't get that particular tree cutting saw down this path or whatever. And the police always come in and try to tear down their barricades and people have started butting heads more and more. As the price of this project increases, George, it seems that tension has also seemed to increase because there's a level of urgency to just get it done that starts coming from people. When do you think that tensions start? When did, when did things start to turn for the worse with this? Oh, I want to say maybe uh, fall of last year. 
Um, you started to see like a truck get overturned here or there. Um, you had a, a, a few arrests and the cops have made a big deal about the fact that the folks who are getting arrested are generally from out of town, that they're w white people with money from places like Kittabunkport, Maine. And that's important, I think, because uh, it shows that there's a national interest in what's going on here. Um, things really like the, but when Tortuguita is uh, an activist who was uh, killed by the, by the police, um, and there's still some controversy over the circumstances of that. They found a gun, the gun was registered to him, uh, but there's a question about how the shooting actually started. Yeah, who uh, shot first? Who shot first? Yeah. There is some non-zero chance you met this guy. Well, I met twenty to thirty. They wouldn't all agree to be on camera. The ones that you, that you saw on camera for our piece, that was a small fraction of yeah. the forest defenders I met that day. Yeah. So that's sort of that energized things. Um, the there were vigils in fifty other cities around the country uh, in the days that followed. Uh, Tortuguita's death. Um, and I think that's what led to what happened last night, where um, they've started a week of protest. You know, they had a concert out in the forest, uh, like sort of a festival. And then a bunch of guys dressed up in black and set construction equipment on fire uh, and started throwing uh, fireworks at, at the cops who came to put it out. They arrested, usually it's five or six people, maybe 10. They arrested 35 last night. I think we're going to see more escalation. Yeah, this was at the beginning of March in 2023 when that happened. Like to that point, and and I and I want to be fair to the forest defenders, but I want to I want to kind of pose a question to the two of you. Does protest because they love to get into you know respectability politics when it's time to protest, right? They go, well, you're protesting, but you have to leave at 8 p.m. The proper protest window is this time, and stand here, and this is the protest way. Whereas the forest defenders have done what they've done with Cop City, and they have effectively delayed construction. They have effectively increased awareness of the issue. They have effectively drawn more attention to the issue. But does the way that they are drawing attention to the issue then give the police and the supporters of this issue justification to go see they are terrorists. They are ter that guy was shooting fire. I'm a sworn law enforcement officer. Does that approach to protesting only embolden the people who want Cop City to happen? Uh, yes, directly. Yes. Um and in the case of Atlanta, it's a city built on respectability politics and especially with black respectability oh. politics. And I think it's interesting, especially in the real world, like the average person in Atlanta still vaguely understands what cop city is. But what they do understand is that, oh, no, these weird leftists from Portland are burning police things again. Right. And so that's kind of been used as like some of the propaganda and getting this promoted. And so now you have general other police departments from around the metro area who are starting to show up. Like last night, there was a bunch of them who showed up as a show of force to the site for no reason. But now it's becoming like a slight culture war in that respect as well. And Atlanta really doesn't, historically doesn't really uh, budge against authority for the most part. This Atlanta way of doing things, of having respectability politics, protest before dark, make sure you're in the house, have, you know, apply for a permit to protest. All those yeah. things have played into like the, the ecosystem of Atlanta. And I do want to add just one other thing, which is, it is now becoming more and more difficult to protest. You have to not only like apply for permits to protesting, but we have this thing that happened in the summer of 2020, then double down again uh, in this upcoming legislative session about cracking down on protests and this thing called the Police Officers Bill of Rights, which makes it really hard now for a protest to not only protest police directly, but if an officer, you know, let's say he pushes a person and that person falls on another officer, that person could be charged with assault. Or if somebody wants to fund the forest defenders, um, that person could be charged with aiding a terrorist organization or aiding an organization against law enforcement. So they're slowly mm -hmm. and systematically reducing the parameters of protest to make it seem as if no protest exists in Atlanta. The, the other side of this, in a matter of speaking, is that there is a the protest, the, they may actually have a practical veto here. So. This project is looks like 90 million, looks like it's actually going to be more than 90 million. But here's the thing. The Atlanta Police Foundation says that they've got 60 million dollars in pledges, but they're also trying to uh, borrow money in order to get this thing built. And the longer this takes, <laughs> 
with interest rates doing what interest rates are doing and what construction costs are doing, like at some point, it's entirely possible that this gets away from the Atlanta Police Foundation financially simply because this gets delayed. If they, if the forest defenders can delay this thing for a year or 18 months, it may no longer be financially viable. And what the, they're, they may be counting on is that the Atlanta Police Foundation will try to go hat in hand to the city of Atlanta and say, I know that we said that you only needed to spend 30 million, but we really need 60 million. And at that point, the, uh. the city will have to put this up in a bond referendum. And there will be a vote on whether or not Cop City should go forward. And if you're one of the forest defenders, you think you could win that vote. And that's so strategically, it's not, yeah, you're going to piss off a lot of people, but that's not stupid in that regard. Okay, so then to that point, George, who are the people that are in support of building Cop City? If we know Cop City is bad for the environment, if we know that it could create a culture of potential over-policing or over-aggressive policing, if we're not focusing all the, on all the other aspects of police training that help to de-escalate, because it sounds like Cop City is one big, hey, when, when, when shit escalate, this is when you come here to learn how to handle shit when shit escalates. <laughs> how, who are the people that are bankrolling this and why are they still okay with it? I, I, there's gotta be something this big. It's gotta be some corporate money behind it. It's gotta be some government money behind uh -huh. it. Like, who, who, how are these people still, how are those organizations still okay with the cop city moving forward? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of corporate money here. Uh, the Atlanta police foundation has got a bunch of banks, including Wells Fargo. Um, there's uh, Chick-fil-A, Chick Truist, I think, um, Cox Enterprises, like Cox Cable, which in, it includes the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which makes for fun reading about this. Like the, the paper swears on a stack of Bibles. No, 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 we're not biased, even though the corporate owners have are leading. They're the guys who are leading the fundraising effort for this. Um mm -hmm. There's a lot of corporate money involved, um, and it's suspicious in my opinion. But and I think the, re the here's the thing though: those corporations that are contributing to this, all they're doing is buying influence. I don't think they actually give one damn about Cop City as a thing, but they know that the Atlanta Police Foundation can jerk the city council around and potentially cost some city council seats. And as long as that's nice. true, they can influence the city council by by funding the Atlanta Police Foundation. Yeah, I, I won't get into the weeds of the things I learned in the state of Alabama when I was trying to shoot my sitcom for Comedy Central in 2018, but I did learn that if you want to get a politician to do something, you don't talk to the politician, you talk to the politician's bankroll. And so, if the Atlanta police are the people that have the leverage over the politicians and you do something in their favor, then they are more likely to. So, yeah, I could I could I could see that. So it's less of a yay police versus sooner or later we need you to pass a law that's going to help our company. We Chick-fil-A. We need the chicken to be cheaper. So if I give you a little money for Cop City, make sure the chicken is cheap so I can make a little extra profit. Bingo. Does increasing the cost of Cop City, is that the only like effective way to get corporations to go wait a minute we got to pull out of this because it sounds like it sounds like money is the only thing that's really getting anything done so far or affecting the cost of it it doesn't seem like morals have entered the conversation at all yeah at this point right now it's definitely money um and you said something earlier i do want to add into that which is that the average person in atlanta again still really doesn't know what cop city is like they get their news from either social feeds or the five o'clock news for the most part and when they hear about this and they're kind of ambivalent, the difference is once you start getting into a lot of like the, the details of the deal, it goes from like ambivalent to a, hey, we should really reconsider a lot of parameters on this really fast. And the reason why I think there's a lot of money trying to push this ahead of time is because once the average person in Atlanta starts to learn a little bit more about it, and especially now with the, the communities in South DeKalb who are also now becoming included in this conversation about the environmental racism, there's a lot more people now who are really starting to question the nature of this project. Yeah, they may not necessarily like the out-of-towners pushing over cars and, and you know throwing firecrackers, but they do want to know there's some other things Cop City is representing 
that they're either not getting directly and direct aid or that's going to affect them really fast. So it's kind of become an issue of time. And money is like proceeding faster than the time is allowed for people to really think about it. Would it have mattered if the if the protester was from Decatur or whether or not they from Maine, if they're there to fight against something? Why is that even a talking point to try and get people to disregard what these people are willing to die for? It's an old nativist strategy, but I promise you I'm from Decatur. If that person would have been from Decatur, there wouldn't have been no cops. There wouldn't have been no force. Like people in Decatur, just they operate very differently. And so I do think that People, when they bring up this out of town thing, it makes the narrative that, you know what, people in Atlanta support this. These are people, it's like the good old boy system of like, oh, these outside agitators coming in and really like stirring up this the pot. But if it was, again, somebody from Decatur, if it was a 19 year old from Decatur, I guarantee you, not only would Cop City not be there, Andre Dickens is probably not the mayor at this point, right? Like people in Atlanta mm-hmm. move very differently if they feel like one of their own have been disrespected. And I think that's something that they've been leaning on with, with regards to Cop City is like, hey, one of us didn't do this. This was one of them from outside of our state. And that's kind of what we're seeing play out right now. Does the environmental yeah. racism part of this, when we talk about, you know, creating cancer alleys from a lot of the burn off, you know, you got a burn building, that means you got smoke. That means you got chemicals going in the water because they take chemicals to make fake fire, you know, to make control fires. So what about the surrounding cities? Because the river don't stop in the Atlanta metro. It keeps yeah. running on down the state. Have any of the other states even came in and just has Lawrenceville checked in? Has Macon, Georgia checked in? <laughs> hey, could y'all not send the cancer downstream, please? We would appreciate. Like, how much is the rest? Of, where does the rest of surrounding Georgia? You know, I, I can't. God, I can't remember I, the comedian I, that made the joke. Atlanta is Atlanta, but it's surrounded by Georgia. Has Georgia checked in on what Atlanta is doing? So for the most part, I don't think Georgia cares. I think part of it is because like the rest of the Georgia hates Atlanta. Like, and like once you get out of Metro Atlanta, like they, if they could shoot Atlanta, they would. Like there's literally like, like they were ready to blow up Atlanta and split off Buckhead. (laughs) <laughs> from the rest of the city. Oh, they trying Not to because, do that now. We don't even have the yeah. time to talk about that. They're, <laughs> no, trying to, like, they're trying to secede from the city. <laughs> everybody else, every, like if you're a politician from the rest of the state, like you run against those horrible liberals in Atlanta and they can do nothing right and to heck with them. Like that's, that is the attitude outside of Metro Atlanta. But how's it going to affect them? Don't they know that? First off, lay out some of the ways this could affect those surrounding areas. And are they going to just, you know, just not going to say nothing? So it depends on exactly who you're talking to. Like, because if you are in suburban Columbus, you know, and it's a like red state Georgia, Mm -hmm. uh, like you're like, yeah, maybe there's runoff, but we don't care because it's not going to hurt us. Like that would be the attitude. But hey, maybe we can drive our police department up there and go do some fancy training for a lot cheaper than we could do it before, and it'll yeah. be better. I, for the most part, I think the rest of the state, maybe even surrounding states, like this, the police narrative controls how they're going to view this. If they're pro cop. They're pro cop city. If they want police accountability, then they've heard about why cop city is wrong. But I don't think that they're going to have as much. Like, here's the thing Atlanta does not want, like, the city of Atlanta and DeKalb County really don't want the rest of the country and the rest of the state weighing in on this. They want to be in control of what's happening in their own backyard. Because generally speaking, when other people come in, like, that's. That's when you get like our red state Republican governor like taking a dump on the city, and and they're afraid of that, and I and, and I understand that. Like that's why they're pushing this outside agitators thing, even though it is this horribly racist callback. I got to tell you, to like nineteen sixties, those northern agitators are coming <laughs> in here to like it, and that's what it sounds like to me because I know these things, but. But they think that it'll buy them some space. Well, after the break, we're going to bring it home and talk about some of the other initiatives that have been going on in and around the city of Atlanta to help rectify a lot of issues that have been happening in Atlanta. Uh, Also, um, after the break, I need to get your recommendations for the best lemon pepper wings. That's why 75,000 people a year moving to Atlanta. It's them damn wings. 
Stop having good wings and then maybe people wouldn't move there. <laughs> this is Beyond the Scenes. We'll be right back. Beyond the Scenes, we round in third and headed for home. We are talking about Cop City and the different pros and cons of it. Now, George, before we got to the break, we were laughing, but still being a little serious about some of the different initiatives and referendums that have been put in place in Atlanta in the last couple of years. We talk about the city of Buckhead trying to set, like essentially the way Beverly Hills ain't part of Los Angeles no more. Like it's still LA, but we're Beverly Hills. We have our own city hall. We have our own police department. Uh, King, have, have there been other initiatives and referendums that have been passed in the last couple of years in Atlanta? Uh, in terms of secession, no, not like the Buckhead yeah. cityhood thing, but in terms of cityhood, yes, everyone right now in Metro Atlanta is trying to create their own fiefdoms. And Sandy Springs really kicked that off. They're in North Fulton County, just outside the city limits of Buckhead, actually. And in 2005, they became the first to really kick off this modern cityhood movement. And since then, every uh, municipality has tried to do their own version of, hey, we're not going to allocate our tax dollars to help those people. You can infer what that means when every time that comes up. Um, the thing that makes it different now is that we've had, since 2005, we've only had two black ones. One is the city of Stonecrest. Um, and then we also have South Fulton. And so those are two majority black cityhood efforts, and they have had a varying de degree of success compared to the white ones. Um, but everyone right now is trying to be their own version of a city and Buckhead being its own version of a city led by people outside of the state. I mean, outside of the metro Atlanta area is the latest in the, a, a long chapter in that. But if these predominantly white areas, which I would assume are probably red, red parts of town, <laughs> little okay wealthy but not necessarily red purplish if you mm -hmm. will okay a little bit <laughs> george is like eh, kind of sort of why leave atlanta like is it decisions like the cop city thing is it decisions like you know the way that the rayshard brooks trial of those officers was handled what are the pros and cons of leaving the city why can't atlanta just say get the hell on and we don't need your little fucking little tax dollars so, i'm good i got chick-fil-a in my back pocket <laughs> i'm gonna go off for a second because the whole buckhead thing was uh a lot how much profanity can i use in oh this, lay it. In this podcast? come on baby lay it lay it do what you want so the whole it's just bullshit that was created by one guy who was a fundraiser for trump like in this one racist felt straw piece of shit, like it decides I can like, there's this untapped group of rich, white, uh, conservative Tucker Carlson watching people who've got more money than sense, who the Republican party has never figured out how to fundraise off of effectively. And so in comes this guy from New York who moves into Buckhead and says, we should split Buckhead off because Atlanta sucks. And he's just, it's just an excuse to send out newsletters raising money. It was never going to pass. It was never, ever, ever going so to pass. it was aroused to fundraise, and then when you lose, you go, see, they don't want us to be great. Join me in the fight <laughs> with a $5 donation. Yes. Uh, more like a $5,000 donation. Oh, shit, like, hang on now. Hey, hey, man, it's Buckhead. I mean, you got to know. Goes. Like... That's it. That's all that was. And a lot of this other stuff is like in the same vein. It's this idea that black communities can't figure out how to govern themselves. At least that's the that's the lie. And so like if you don't like if you don't like the idea of having a black mayor as a white person, here's a way for you to get up and around that. Even to that point though, like what you said about the, the Buckhead City Hood thing was interesting because for a host of reasons, it was never going to work, which is why Brian Kemp had to come in and kind of put the foot down on that one. But the other issue is Cop City was brought to the Buckhead business leaders as a way to keep away secession from Atlanta. It was like, hey, you know, you want police in, uh, around the Ray Sharbrooks uh, around June of 2020. I mean, we have even by August of 2020, they're already in cahoots with a couple. They I'm not going to say um, certain city council members are already talking to Buckhead leaders about what can they do to support the police. And by December of 2020, we already have like the plan that would eventually become cop city. So it was always, always going to be a part of it. And Buckhead was always going to be leading that effort to have cop city. So the fact that this person in particular wanted to lead a fundraising 
effort to secede from Atlanta based on the notion of police was just one of the best scams in Atlanta history. I mean, it's maybe a top five moment. How much do the police respect the data of how crime is lowered versus simply passing things that will get them the support of their community? Like if we're talking local politician and you know XYZ reading initiative will help. We know that the connection between literacy and crime rates, the more area can read, the lower the crime rate is in that area. We also know that you could take some of the money for the police tank and create a, a non weaponized response like they have in Portland. Portland has a, an, a, a division that is just responding to mental health and and minor domestic stuff that the cops normally would be the ones going to, which is less work on your police, which is less stress on your police, which equals a higher morale and a better work, better work environment. Those things could all contribute to lowering crime. So why be so dedicatedly invested into the one thing that makes it seem like the only way to be tough on crime is in a punitive way? Because let's be real, there's three Southerners on this on this podcast right now. We all came up in the ass whooping phase of the South. So tough, heavy hand, billy club. Do cops and politicians, do they really believe that all this and all these other initiatives will really help to lower crime? So Atlanta. I got a lot to say about this. Because if that's like, what you're selling to DeKalb and Sandy Springs and fucking Villa Rica, like if that's what you're trying to get them to be a part of, aren't you still lying? Like, is it, the shooter's going to shoot. Drama's still going to be drama. So it's funny. Like, the city's got, like, a Portland-style thing. They started it a few years ago. I was actually on the design team for the pre-arrest diversion initiative in Atlanta. Okay. Um, and... Thing is, it it gets like three or four million dollars a year. It's got like a dozen, maybe two dozen people who are working on it, and it's hamstrung by all of the other things that are broken. The jail is broken. The courts are broken. The cops are kind of broken. Um, the district attorney's office doesn't have enough staff to really do all the things they need to do. There aren't enough public defenders to go around. Like it's like there's this gigantic mess in the system. Meanwhile, like they're going to spend $30 million on Cop City and their, uh, their idea here is, okay, so we're spent there in their head. They're going, well, we're already spending all this money on all of these other things like bail reform and all the rest. So we should probably spend more money on the cops too. Like in their head, this is a balance. Like this is the balancing point to all of the other stuff that they're doing, even though all the other stuff that they're doing is really not nearly enough. Mm-hmm. And it is a lot less than they're spending on, on police. The problem is, as soon as you say that, somebody comes in and says, you want to defund the police? And then, ah! And everybody yeah. turns into a Muppet. Yeah. But that's also because defund wasn't the best word because people thought they meant take all the money. It was like, nah, man, just, you don't need a tank. Here's a here's an <laughs> SUV instead. Here's a fortified SUV instead of a tank. And we're going to take that tank money and we're going to put some Dr. Seuss books in the hood and we're gonna lower crime. <laughs> That's all we were trying to do. Uh, how, I'll, I'll end with, with this question for the two of you. How do you all feel the city of Atlanta is being perceived nationally? How, how uh, the perception of the city of Atlanta, has it evolved or devolved over the last few years with Cop City being a big part of this and you know Governor Kemp threatening to send in the National Guard. You know, the National Guard going to come in there and let's just say the, the National Guard, if there's anybody need to go to Cop City for some training, it's probably the National Guard because <laughs> they ain't training as often as the cops about how to do cop stuff. How do you all feel the city of Atlanta is has been perceived? Like, this, does this set a bad precedent for the city, you know, in terms of the reputation of it? Does it encourage other cities to build their own cop city? Is Memphis going to be inspired? Is Miami going to be inspired? Oh, my God. Uh, all right. I, I swear to God, I hope everyone does not try to make their own cop city for a host of reasons. It's bad for money, bad for land use, bad for the environment. That's personally. Um, what I do think, though, over time, Atlanta is going to win. Atlanta always wins out. That's the beauty of being in Atlanta is no matter what, you always win. Over the last couple of years, though, and in combination with Cop City in the last few years, of the previous mayor and just in general, 
there has been a push of like Atlanta is it's black, but it's not the Mecca anymore. And I do think that if Atlanta is not working on brand control right now, you could have a scenario in which people really just leave Atlanta, right? Atlanta doesn't have the infrastructure. Atlanta doesn't have necessarily the connective tissue like a New York City does or a Miami that you mentioned, or even LA to keep attracting black people. So I do think the current mayor after this cop city phase goes over, um, he's going to try to figure out how to make Atlanta the black Mecca again or make the Mecca great again because you can't lose that rep that representation that we have. Otherwise, and we're no different from any other city across the country. Yeah, the thing that's on my mind as you're asking this question is the 2024 National Democratic National Convention. The So the mayor is trying, like hell, to get the convention in Atlanta. And I think he might actually be successful. It's either going to be here or Chicago. Like the thing is, if Atlanta is perceived as a place where we've got a bunch of protests over stuff like this, um, that's the image that Atlanta, it, like this whole, Cop City has the potential to change the perception of Atlanta across the country, depending on what's going on, you know, what year, How three or four months out. from now. I'm with King on the Black Mecca thing. Like there's a group of us who are trying to strangle that in a bathtub somewhere like this is a great city it's a great city to be black but if you were born black and poor in atlanta like you are screwed in a lot of ways like it does not it is not a happy place for you um we've got less mobility for less economic mobility than almost anywhere else in the, in the united states uh it's hard to get out it's hard to to climb out of poverty in atlanta and we don't see that we see love and hip-hop we see you know, the Atlanta TV show, we see the Marvel movies, you know, we got rappers eight ways to Sunday talking about Atlanta. I uh, like it. They don't see the hard parts. They don't see why we've got like the, a crime problem that th people think we need to build a cop city to deal with. Um, and I think that's going to change. And if it doesn't, you can always sell the city to Tyler Perry <laughs> and he'll fix it immediately. Gentlemen, I cannot thank you all enough for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. When I get down to Atlanta, um, I'll let you all take me out to your wing spot of choice. We don't have to name no places right now. They didn't pay us for no endorsements. But just please don't take me to the varsity. I've had everything on the menu. <laughs> I've, I've ate at the varsity 48 different times. So I just don't don't take me to the varsity. I got we you. should do better than that. I got you. <laughs> uh, George King, thank you so much for going beyond the scenes with me. Thank you. Thank you.